Well, hi there, and welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. It's going to be different than things we've done, rather than a line-by-line -line study of one of the books of the Bible. This is going to be much broader than that, and I think much more important, much more timely. The program is going to be called In Search of Christianity. Now, that seems very broad. It is. I was just uh, going to say, that's very broad. But you'll see why as we get into it. And this is, let me make it clear, this is a serious study mm -hmm. for people who are serious about God's Word, That's all right? I would suggest that in addition to having your Bible with you, and I, I hope that you have your Bible, that's a good thing to have at a Bible study, mm -hmm. that you might want to have pen, paper, or something to take notes. And as you're taking, if you, if you take notes, if you have ideas, if you have questions, if you have suggestions, if you have comments, Jot them down and then write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. We would love to hear from you. And I think this needs to be as interactive a, a program as we can possibly make it. So we'll get into it right away. But first, I'm going to ask, well, let me first of all greet you. Yeah. <laughs> In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on behalf of myself, I'm Alan McDaniel, my lovely wife, Alice, and our dear Hello. brother, Mark Switos. Hello. And our dear brother, Mark Swaitos, is about to ask God's blessing on our time together here. Oh, Lord, we just thank you that wherever two or three people are gathered in your name, that you're with them as you are here now. Okay, and we thank you for being here and just guide us to where we go and let us pry out of your word nuggets that we can apply to the world that we live, to give to other pe people, and just put your word into our brains and our hearts. Amen. 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 All right, so this is the introduction to this new and ongoing study, uh, ongoing series. And I want to cover three things as we get into it here today. And I want to talk about the premise of this program. I want to talk about the, the measure, the objective measure that we'll use in this program. And we're going to talk about defining Christianity. Now, the, the premise, the idea, the reason for this is that it seems to me that Christianity has a thousand different faces. Mm -hmm. And to make it quite clear, our faith should only ever have one face. Because there's only one face that reveals the knowledge of God's glory. It says in 2 Corinthians 4, for God, who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. That's where people will find and see the glory of God. Okay? Amen. Now, I've been blessed. I've spent time uh, in, in 50 countries on five different continents, from up at the Arctic Circle to down below the, uh, the equator, from the Pacific Ocean on the west to the Persian Gulf on the east. And I've, I've been blessed to have preached and taught in, for no, nearly 40 years in uh, probably more than two dozen different denominations. So now when I travel, while I expect to see people speak different languages, dress differently, eat different foods, I've had an expect expectation to find a common faith. Mm. Okay, I understand different cultures, right. but I have a reasonable expectation to find within the, within the church right. a common faith, to find common, common belief and common spiritual attitudes. Mm. And I've all too often been disappointed in that reasonable expectation. You see... I want to find a like precious faith through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. That's what Peter said. Second Peter chapter one, chapter one, verse one. There should be a like precious faith. Wouldn't that be the remnant? Well, 
that's what we need to talk about because that like precious faith is the faith Jesus said that when the Son of Man comes, mm -hmm. which uh, may who knows how soon, but it could very be soon, soon. Very soon. He said, "Will he find faith?" Mm -hmm. That faith that he's going to look for is that like precious faith yes. that he comes from him. See, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth and said, "God is not a God of confusion, but of peace." Mm -hmm. Right? First Corinthians fourteen. Right. But that said, people's idea of what Christianity is seems to be just about as confusing as anything can get. Mm -hmm. yes. I mean, if you were to ask a thousand Christians what Christianity is, you'd probably get a thousand and ten answers. Yeah, it's true. All right? The World Christian Encyclopedia, which has been published by Oxford University Press in 2001, counted 33,820 different denominations in 238 countries. Well, it, it, it was typically the differences in practices and belief that led to that division, that gross division. Mm -hmm. And it all too often led to adversarial relations between those different groups. I mean, in some cases it led to, literally led to war between them, right? So which one of those denominations would we say to the world represents what Christianity truly is? Okay, you want to answer that question? You're no, on dangerous I've, ground. I've okay. just got a question. Yeah. We just finished a study in the book of Revelation studying the seven churches. Were those denominations? Because each no, one of those had, had a personality. Yeah, no, but no, they're not denominations, okay? They're, they're all one church, all right? The, but uh, the seven different locations. Yeah. Okay. Right? And that's why, typically in scriptures, it talks about a church at this place. Mm -hmm. not, not of that place. We're to be in the world, but not of it. It's not, you know, what it is, is that we're just, we're, we are the, you know what? Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. And he said, there is one body, mm -hmm. one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's only one church. Only one. And do I need to tell you that it, Paul also wrote, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, let there be no division among you. <clears throat> How important is that? Well, I'm going to sidetrack myself as usual a little bit, but I do want to say this. Years ago, I was over and I was speaking to a, a large group of pastors in Yonde, Cameroon. That's the capital of Cameroon. Mm -hmm. And I was there speaking to, I don't, I don't remember, 100 pastors and they had been gathered from all over Africa and some from Europe and actually some from the Caribbean. And we had been there for five nights and I had been talking to them. And this was the last night and the following day they were going to be flying back to wherever they had come from or going back however they came. And it just struck me as I was talking to them. And I said, these are all pastors. These are all men of God. All right. Uh, I said to them. I want you to take one second and just think about what has been on your mind. What you have you been seriously praying about? What have you been, you know, what have you been praying for most sincerely? You know, crying out to God most, most importantly about. And I asked them to think about that. And I said, well, stop and let me just ask you a question now. I said, suppose you knew, suppose you had revelation from God, from the Holy Spirit, and you knew without doubt, without fail, that you would not reach home tomorrow. That tomorrow would be the last day that you would ever spend on earth. Suppose you knew if God spoke to you and told you, this is it, tomorrow it ends for you. How would that affect what you're praying for? I think drastically. Well, you know, I've been blessed to be in that kind of position once where I, I thought it was all over when, you know, I, I got hit by a speeding semi-truck down in Central America. And as I lay there, I'd been hit, I was on foot and I got hit by a speeding semi-truck. And I was fairly certain at that time that it was over. You were going to see Jesus. And all of a sudden, I, you know, a lot of things in my life that I haven't very, just didn't seem quite so important. It kind of focuses your prayer life. I think Winston Churchill once said, there's nothing like, like getting shot at to focus you. <laughs> think about that just for a second. And then... I want to call to your mind, that's exactly where Jesus Christ was the night that he went into the garden. Mm -hmm. He knew it's over. 
The time has come. It was the appointed time. And he went into the garden and he prayed. And what did he pray for? He prayed that we would be one. Unity. So how important is that? Well, study the word and you'll find that it's very important. And you will find by observing the church that it is very rare indeed to find that kind of unity in the church. But he's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle, and it's going to happen. It may happen with us kicking and screaming. But you know, it says, The effective prayer of a righteous man availeth much, and Jesus prayed we would be one. We will be one. The prayer has already been answered. Amen. It just hasn't manifested yet. Well, because um, maybe we get in the way sometimes. Yeah. All right. The purpose of this series, then, is to cut through all of the doctrines, traditions, and myths of men to determine the reality of what the Lord Jesus said that he would, what he would build, a church that the gates of hell could not prevail against. Okay? To do that, the first thing we have to do is determine, you have to have an objective measure. One of the problems has been is, if I, you know, if I ask people what church is, they're going to, they start thinking about, well, it's their traditions, it's their this, it's that. Program. There has to be an objective. Do you understand the difference? Most of us talk about Christianity, we talk about it in subjective terms. Okay? Subjective means it's, it's subject to, to, to change, interpretation. What you think can be different than what I think. Objective means that there is a truth. There is an underlying truth that can't be changed. All right? I'm going to talk about common versus normal because I think this is very important. Now, I've, I've been, as I said, I've been teaching for close to 40 years, and I've been saying for close to 40 years, one of the things that the devil wants to rob from us because he comes as a thief to steal is our ability to effectively communicate with one another and communicate with God, right? Every relationship is built upon communications, okay? So he's trying to destroy our, of our, our vocabulary where words don't matter anymore. You know, it, words always matter. And particularly, God's word matters, okay? Because his word is holy and pure. It's truth. It's what he uses to lead and guide us. It's what he used to speak the world into right. existence. His word. Jesus is the word. Yes. He said that he is the truth. His word is truth. Well, let me just give you an example. And I, like I said, I'm going. Words are important. So, pardon me if I talk to you about words and what they mean. I want to talk about the difference between common and normal. Okay. And I'm going to talk to you about what the words really mean, not the way they're commonly used. Because commonly used means that it may mean one thing to you, and it may mean another thing to him. But the fact is, there is an objective truth of what normal means, all right? In the time of Jesus Christ, it was very, very common that there were people who were lame and halt and blind, and right? I mean, it, yes. all through the New Testament, you see this, right? That was common. I want to read you an account. It says in Matthew 12, And a man was there, Jesus goes into the synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered. And they, the Pharisees, questioned Jesus, asking, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him? And he said to them, What man is there among you who has a sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will he not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable then is a man than a sheep, so then it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath? Listen to this now. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and it was restored to normal, like the other. I'm going to tell you now, deformity, blindness, lameness, all those things, sickness, were never intended by God to be normal. It says in Psalm 139, we are wonderfully, we're fearfully and wonderfully made, all right? But it was all too common. There are, so, there are so many things in Christianity today that are common to Christianity, but I promise you, they are not normal. It was never normal. Okay? Division in the church today is all too common. Yes. 
It is not normal. Man-made traditions and practices, as Jesus and the Apostle Paul warned against, were there and are there today, and they're all too common, but they're never normal. The word normal comes from a Latin word, normalis, which means, literally means, made according to a carpenter's square. A carpenter's square. Don't forget that Jesus had been a carpenter in the steps of his earthly father, Joseph. That's right. And a carpenter's square, the thing about it is it's always the same. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how, if Jesus was making a table or making a chair, he would use a carpenter's square to make sure that it was perfectly square. Right. 90 degrees from here to here. Not 89 some days and 91 the other days. It's always 90 degrees. That's a truth. That was true 2,000 years ago. It's true today. It's true whether you're in Moscow or whether you're in New York City. It's true whether you're old or young. It's true. It doesn't matter. That stays the same. It doesn't change. It's always the same. Jesus Christ, who is the Word of God, is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. That is, He is the word is the objective truth that is unchanging. The Lord who promised to lead us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake spoke through Solomon, known for his wisdom, that we are to trust in the Lord with all of our hearts and not lean on our own understanding. Proverbs 3, 5. We can't lean on our own understanding, but he's given us a way that we can. He said, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Through the Psalms, Psalm 119, 105. That's what's supposed to guide us. That light is his word. It's by abiding in his word that we will arrive at and know the truth. Jesus said, John chapter 8, So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, If you abide, if you continue in my word, you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. It is too common for the church to be bound by those doctrines of men, by those traditions, by those myths. And the only thing that will set us free is God's word, which does change, which doesn't change. We're going to be guided in this, in this series as we go along. And this is very important. We're going to be guided by the word. All right? So if you question what I say, and by the way, you should. I tell you, don't take my word for anything. Test it against the word of God. Like Paul, said, right, Paul said, test all things, examine all things, and hold fast to that which is good. All right? So test what I say. So we're going to do this according to the word, but we're also going to take note of, we're going to take prayerful note of what is not in the word. See, Peter wrote, said, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. 2 Peter 1, 3. We've been given everything here in the Word. So we have a record of, in the New Testament of roughly nine decades, 90 years of history. 60 years after the death, burial, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So we have a really good picture, a generation and a half at least, of the early church mm -hmm. after the day of Pentecost, after Jesus left, right? right? So we need to not only take note of what God spoke and taught through them, but we need to kind of consider what they didn't say. Right. Because if it was important, God would have said it through them, <clears> right? Been there. All right. So the next thing and the last thing on, on this introduction is I want to talk about we need to define Christianity. Mm -hmm. If you're going to go and search for something, you have to know what it looks like. That's right. You know, I said the other day, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but you can always look it up. Mm -hmm. If I said, well, I want to go out and look for a catch, K-E-T-C-H, a catch, you, you might say, what is that? And I would say it's a sailboat. Well, all catches are sailboats. Not all sailboats are catches. All sailboats are boats, not all boats are sailboats, all right? You have to know what you're looking for. So we need to understand what true Christianity is in order to search for it, okay? Yes. 
Now, this is what I mean about it being confusing, is because typically the church is defined by an organization, by a building, by religious traditions and practices, okay? That's not, that does not define Christianity. And I'm going to say, and I trust that over the coming weeks I'll be able to show you from the Word, that Christianity is first and foremost a relationship with God the Father through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. That's the foundational truth. And secondly, Christianity is a commitment to Christ without concern for cost or consequence. Thirdly, Christianity is the imitation of Jesus Christ, who is the rock of offense over which men stumble. Now, if you have other ideas, you know, I don't think, you, if you find one that contradicts this, please, <laughs> please, first, and go have a conversation with the Lord and say, did you hear what he said? What's the matter with him? And see what he says, okay? And if at the end of that conversation you still feel like I'm wrong, which I can be, sit down and write me at office at BibleTalk.com. People often ask me what church I belong to. Like I said, well, you know, I've traveled much of the world. And people say to me, because we meet people for the first time in churches all over, and I say, what church do you belong to? And I can only reply by saying, uh, I don't belong to any church. I belong to Jesus Christ. I was purchased with a price. I am the church. Okay. We are together. We are the church. What is normal? The word Christian is used frequently in the Bible. Infrequently in the Bible, by the way. No. The word, no, the word, 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 no, the word Christianity. Oh, Christianity. The word Christian yes. is only used three times in the New Testament. Okay? And only one time are we certain that it's used by a Christian in regard to other Christians. Mm -hmm. Other times, we, the first time it appears that it's used by pagans about the, the believers, and the se second time it is definitely used by a pagan about a believer. Okay. The third time it's Peter, and Peter says, but if anyone suffers as a Christian, he's not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in, in this name, First Peter 4, 16. That's the only one specifically we know. So it's not a frequent. There are a lot of names. Followers of the way, you know, believers. This, so, you know, it was never defined that way. It was never defined that way. But the word literally means follower of Christ. And the Greek word that Peter uses there for follower is the same that Paul used five or six other times. For example, he said, therefore be imitators, followers, in the King James, of God. Be, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Ephesians 5, 1. A Christian is to be, as I said, an imitator of God. Amen. To imitate, words are important. To imitate, now, there's a difference between being a counterfeit and being an imitating, all right? Mm -hmm. Satan, Isaiah 14 says, I will make myself like the Most High God. He's a counterfeiter. He's a liar by nature and the father of lies. To imitate means to copy. Mm -hmm. And that derives from the Latin word imago, for being in the image of. Okay. So we're to imitate, we're to be in the image of. Gosh, that makes me think of this. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all of the earth over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Genesis 126. God designed us to be in the image, to be imitators, to be like him. His purpose since the fall of man in the garden, all those many, many years ago, has always been to restore man back into his image. That's why he could speak through the Apostle Paul and say, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn of many brethren. God's purpose is to once again make us look like him. That's the purpose. What he started. Amen. In the very beginning. In order to imitate Jesus, mm -hmm. 
a Christian must, not should. I'm not saying a Christian should. I'm saying a Christian must think like Jesus, right? It says in 1 Corinthians 2.16, we have the mind of Christ. It says in Romans 12.2, that we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. It says in 2 Corinthians 10.5, we're to take <laughs> thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. We have to talk like Jesus. It says if any man speaks, let him speak as one speaking the oracles of God. We have to act like Jesus, like him, be holy in all our behavior. That's what it says in 1 Peter. And above all, we have to love like Jesus. He said, love one another, even as I have loved you. They all go together. A person can talk right and not be right. That's right. That's why God spoke to the prophet Isaiah and said, this people draws near to me with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me. And their reverence of me consists of tradition learned by the precepts of men. Isaiah 29, 13. A person can act right and not be right. As Jesus made clear when he said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to spend a lot of time in the Sermon on the Mount, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It boils down to love. His love that's been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Remember, God's word is not a compilation of suggestions. It's all his commandment. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm going to close with this, talking about the imitation of Christ. Because the word says, have this mind, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as, man, as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Well, as we look for what true Christianity is, in, in fact, so we can practice true Christianity, in fact, not for judgment, but for encouragement, for knowledge, for wisdom, so we are equipped to walk as Jesus walked. Mm -hmm. As we do that, I pray that you be here, you join us, encourage others to come and, and be here. It's going to be posted up on the Bible Talk website. This is important, and I promise you it's going to be controversial, yes. because we, as we look at what the church is doing that God doesn't want us doing to get away from that. So I'm, I'm glad we're, we're finally kicked this off. And I pray that you'll be back with us, that you'll tell others about it, and that you'll participate. Amen. Have conversations with Jesus. And in your prayers, that's what conversations are, please remember that listening is more important than speaking because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So until next time, may the Lord our God bless you. Far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. But I love that old Best for a world of lost sinners.